Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's roundtable discussion on coastal cities, ground zero for climate adaptation and resilience. I am so grateful for all of you joining us today. My name is Sally Ozell, and I'm the director of the Environmental Security Program here at the Stimson Center. For those of you who do not know our program, we examine environmental threats, including climate change, illegal fishing, and wildlife trafficking that really have the potential to undermine national, regional, and global security. Related to our discussion today, our climate work focuses on coastal city adaptation, where we work with a diverse range of partners to really build solutions using a research to action model. So we are also so pleased to be hosting today's event with Island Press, the leading nonprofit publisher on sustainability and the environment. And today we'll be discussing how coastal cities, both in the US and abroad, are developing innovative solutions to the climate crisis. And we will also be highlighting a new book, A Blueprint for Coastal Adaptation, United Design, Economics, and Policy. The title of the book really gets at the heart of the issue. We can only achieve resilience in coastal cities if we bring together different stakeholders and experts and practitioners to address this very multi-dimensional threat that is climate change. It really underscores the need for all hands on deck. So if you go to Island Press's webpage, you can purchase a copy of this new book at a 30% discount by using the promotional code WEBINAR. And that's in all capitals, WEBINAR. And this is the kind of book anyone focusing on coastal resilient needs. It's a how to do it right book an integrated guide to actions, and an opportunity to really learn from some of the best experts in the field. And shortly, we'll hear from one of its authors and curators. So why do we need this holistic approach to combating climate change in our cities? I mean, think about it. Located at the interface between land and sea, coastal cities are the centers of innovation and economic productivity, we're concentrating a large number of people and assets. And according to NOAA in the US, 40% of the population live in coastal areas. And the coastal economy contributes something like close to $8 trillion to national GDP. And around the world, 17 of the world's largest mega cities are located on the coast. And this doesn't even account for the hundreds of smaller and mid sized cities, which are virtually vital to the economic security of their coastal nations. But coastal cities are also right at the forefront of climate change, rising sea level, increasing storm in intensity, and warmer temperatures are all stressing ecosystems upon which millions and millions of people depend. And it also is degrading outdated infrastructure and upending so much of the economic stability. The World Economic Forum has estimated that by 2050, at least 70 of the leading cities, that's the leading cities, uh, and some 800 million people in those cities will, will be exposed to rising seas and storm surges. And its global risk report of 2019 noted that 90% of all coastal areas will be affected by climate change impacts, including the many secondary cities. So climate risks also compound existing pressures that cities face every day. In many cities around the globe, we also see things like rapid urbanization, which is outpacing the infrastructure development. And this could be anything from housing, waste management, bridges, and roads. And these factors also exacerbate the social and health inequities. And those are the kind of inequities and issues that all cities face. Poor neighborhoods are often built on low-lying land and are more exposed to climate impacts and the lack of the resources to be able to adapt to what is going on with climate change. So faced with these impacts and in a post-COVID-19 environment, governments, businesses, and international financial institutions really need to consider climate risk across social, economic, and environmental issues to design the kind of comprehensive solutions that can unlock the additional financial resources they need. So at the Stimson Center, we have developed a tool called Corby to address this need. 
basically, Corby, it's a decision support tool that integrates a wide range of climate, environment, social, and economic information to produce this really holistic risk profile for a coastal city. And with this information, then governments are able to use it for governments and international financial institutions and the private sector to prioritize the actions that are so important to build resilience and access additional climate investment. We're currently conducting Corvi in eight cities around the globe and helping decision makers prioritize action where it is needed most. So check out our Stimson and Corvi website to learn more about the individual Corvi cities and our many partners. The discussion today is going to focus on innovations and best practices being employed across urban communities, which are designed to safeguard people, their livelihoods, and to build a more resilient future. We have a fantastic lineup of federal and city government leaders, policymakers, and practitioners who are going to share their insights and firsthand experience on how to develop comprehensive climate adaptation in coastal cities. We're so lucky to have Janie Bavishi, who is the resilience director for the city of New York's office of the mayor, where she directs adaptation planning for the largest city in the United States. Also, we're going to hear from Dr. Carolyn Kuski, who is the executive director of the Wharton Risk Center at the University of Pennsylvania. She's the lead editor of the book I just talked about, The Blueprint for Coastal Adaptation, the book we're highlighting today, and a well-known expert on climate insurance climate risk and insurance. And then we'll hear from Paul Wang, who is the Acting Assistant Administrator of Resilience at the Federal Emergency Management Agency, as we know it as FEMA. And FEMA plays a, a critical role in helping communities across the US prepare for and build back after extreme climate events. And we're so excited about the new FEMA Administrator, Deanne Criswell, who's the first woman to head up FEMA. So our plan is really to have a conversation today with this impressive group. I'm going to ask a couple of questions to our experts, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. So please type in your questions in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. All right, so let's get started. First, um, Carolyn, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, if that's OK. Um, so you have finished, this, finished editing this uh, new and excellent book, A Blueprint for Coastal Adaptation. So at the Simpson Center, we talk a lot about the importance of bringing together the diverse perspectives to build resilience to the climate crisis through a holistic lens. This new book does this. So with perspectives on finance and city planning, insurance and the environment, why did you write this book now? And what are the key takeaways when you bring all of this together? Great. Thank you, Sally. Um, and thanks for organizing this wonderful event. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, so this book arose as a collaboration between our center, the Risk Center at Wharton, and my co-editor, Billy Fleming's Center at the Design School of Penn, and our third co-editor, Alan Berger's Center at MIT, at the MIT Design School. So from the beginning, it was a collaboration across disciplines in design and disciplines in business. And I think it's fair to say that we all found that to be a really useful collaboration, particularly on the topic of adaptation. Um, and I think it's a collaboration that unfortunately doesn't take place as much as it should. I'm not sure design schools and business schools work together um, as often as, as it might be helpful. So a couple of years ago now, we gathered together all the contributors to the book at an all day conference. And we asked them to share their insights, their visions, their policy suggestions, their research findings on how our coastal communities could adapt to climate impacts. But we asked them not only how can these communities adapt, but can we find tools and models that will protect them against the increasing risks like changing storm patterns, um, flooding, that would mute the most immediate impacts of sea level rise, but that could also harness the value of coastal ecosystems and let those ecosystems also evolve, um, and also continue to offer the high level of amenities and preserve the economic value that makes our coast such important places for our country, um, you know, for society, for our economy, and so on. So it was a tall order that we gave um, everyone, and we sort of asked everyone to start from this recognition that many of our traditional um, land use, regulatory, risk management policies and programs 
tend to assume, at least implicitly assume, that things aren't changing very much, that land is permanent, that property rights are in perpetuity, that risk is stable. But not only are coastal areas inherently dynamic places, you know, absent climate change, now we're also seeing the sort of continued um, aggressive change as the planet warms. Um, but nonetheless, we were feeling that our policies didn't fully reflect that. And also maybe just as importantly, often the expectations of residents don't reflect that, right? That we're gonna be in this environment of change. Okay, so that was the charge to everyone at this workshop a couple of years ago. And then after seeing all the great ideas our colleagues had come up with, we thought we really had to bring these contributions together into a book. Um, so our goals with the book were really kind of this, this big picture idea of trying to reimagine coastal communities that could be resilient and adaptive, but also to kind of better link research and practice, to kind of bring the insights from research into policy approaches and also help identify what a sort of new cross-disciplinary policy and research agenda might look alike. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of end by saying, I think there are three key takeaways from the book for me, and maybe my co-editors or other contributors might have different takeaways, but for me, the kind of three things that jump out are first, you know, climate impacts are here now and they're only getting worse. So we can't wait any longer, right? Adaptation, I think has to be considered as an important um, independent domain with its own sort of policies and approaches, but it also has to be integrated into all these other policy conversations that are going on all the time, from housing to transportation to emergency management. Um, and I'll be really excited to hear from both Janie and Paul about their sort of perspectives on how that's happening and how it should be happening. Um, second point, um, as I already mentioned, we're in this period of constant change. And I think that means we have to think differently um, about our policies and approaches. There's not just some new design standard that we can build to and then we've solved adaptation, right? And I think it's gonna take some kind of mental adjusting to come to terms with the idea that things are gonna be continuing to evolve over our lifetime. And that might mean upending some sort of traditional approaches and mental constructs. One that kind of jumps out at me since I spend a lot of time in the economics world is that you know most economists are still trained today to think about decisions as optimization problems, but in today's world of change and also uncertainty, um, you know lots of people are starting to point out that it's probably better not to be thinking of optimality as our decision criterion, but robustness. Right? What strategies are going to perform well under all these different possible future conditions we might experience? And I think that's both the uncertainty about what impacts are going to materialize on what time frame, but it's also the fact that we're going to see greater variability. We might be seeing more intense rainfall at the same time we see worse drought. So we need strategies that can kind of address that, that range of conditions. Okay, last, my very last point, the third sort of takeaway that I think comes out is that um, we don't necessarily need to think about adaptation only as costs. Um, you know, there's a lot of really scary estimates about how much climate impacts are gonna cost us. Um, but if we do this thoughtfully, coastal adaptation could maybe be something that generates enormous value for communities. And I don't want to minimize the pain. I mean, places are going to go underwater. There's going to be transition that's no doubt going to you know, be difficult economically and socially. So I don't mean to minimize that. But I do think that our policy decisions can either, um, you know, will either make that worse <clears throat> or can help make it better. We can either sort of attenuate or ameliorate those those types of impacts. And so I think our policy choices now are really important. So for example, you know, are we gonna be undertaking approaches that exacerbate our existing inequities and inequalities? Or are we gonna take approaches that will give everyone sort of a fair shot at resilience? So um, to end, I think one of the authors in the book highlighted that you could think about building resilience as resilience of a place or resilience of people. And those lead to different approaches. And there might be times you know, where you want one or the other. But I think what a lot of the authors in this book highlight is that coastal adaptation is not just about land use near the water's edge. It's about the people that live there and how we can help make them thrive. Um, anyway, so I think that comes through strongly in the book. Wow, that's, that's terrific. I mean, um, such a good way to look at this from all sides. I mean, as you pointed out, not just the coast, but really thinking about the integration of policies, um, that climate adaptation is needed now, we can't wait. And um, just thinking across so many cross-disciplinary uh, uh, um, areas. But one of the things I'd like to ask you about um, and drill down into one specific area that I know that you are really um, um, an expert on is insurance. Um, and I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are on how we can use insurance to build resilience and stress the importance of bringing together um, uh, the different pers 
perspectives uh, on how insurance can be used because so many people worry about it's so costly or you know they can't afford it or it's going to move them out or whatever. So I'd really be curious what, what your thoughts are on about that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I do think about insurance a lot. So I wrote a chapter um, on it for the book. I want to first note and pick up on a point you just made. Insurance is really critical to people's recovery from weather-related extreme events. Um, we have work showing that other sources of post-disaster financial support for households are really insufficient. And we could you know, unpack that more offline if anyone's interested, but it means that in order to have the resources to rebuild and recover, um, insurance is really necessary for households and businesses. So as climate change is driving up these weather-related extreme events, right, as those risks are increasing, that sort of means that the need for and the value of insurance is increasing too. Yet those same events that are making insurance more important are also threatening insurance markets because as risks go up, it costs more to insure them, right? Um, and so there's sort of growing concern now that we could be entering periods or areas where there'd be an insurability crisis, where climate risks become either too expensive for people to afford, or simply companies aren't willing to kind of write them, right? Um, and indeed, right, we've seen concerns about, you know, wildfire insurance in California and coastal areas. When you start seeing coastal flooding, for example, so frequently that it's happening many times a month, you're sort of out of the realm of a risk and you're into more of a certainty, right? And that's not insurance anymore. That's like where you need risk reduction. And so, the first thing I think I really want to stress is that we need aggressive investments in risk reduction and to see those as a complement to insurance, right? You need both. Like one of them isn't going to solve that. Um, and also, as we see these risks increase, to your other point, Sally, we're going to see, you know, prices climb and that raises important equity questions. We don't want to suppress prices across the board because they provide important signals to markets. Um, but we also need to note that lower income households are disproportionately impacted from disasters. And there's just an enormous body of research on this. They have longer and more difficult recoveries. And that's exacerbated if they're locked out of insurance markets because they can't afford it. So for a long time, I've you know, supported policies that are targeted at helping these households with their recovery. Right now, Congress, for example, is considering a means-tested affordability program for the federal flood insurance program. And that's something that FEMA has done an excellent um, report on. New York City's looked at this. Um, numbers of researchers have looked at this. And I think there's sort of growing consensus that that would be a helpful thing. Um, but that also highlights that because of the challenges with insuring disasters, um, for many perils, disaster insurance is actually provided through public programs like our federal flood insurance program. Or when we're talking about the coast, there's wind pools um, in every state that's subject to hurricanes. So often what we're talking about is not really sort of market impacts, but policy questions of how much we want to cross subsidize increasing risks at the coast. And I think that's a, a conversation that's difficult and we haven't quite come to agreement on um, as a society. So the sort of very last point on this I want to make, though, is as much as this is sort of a policy question about our public insurance programs, in the absence of, say, Congress adopting means tested assistance programs or something else like that, we've been recently exploring um, some private sector or maybe public-private partnerships that could help innovate on our standard approaches to insurance. Um, and this is part of sort of a growing global recognition that there's a sort of many people around the globe that could benefit from the financial resilience of insurance that are locked out of insurance right now um, because of these affordability questions. Um, and so there's been a lot of development of different types of models that you know we won't get into here, but that would help make insurance less expensive and more accessible to people. So we've been um, looking at that sort of private sector approach as well. Excellent. Well, a lot of good points there. And um, I think that will be really helpful as we now move to talk with Janie because uh, you've raised a lot of issues that people are talking about. Now let's get a real uh, perspective of what um, a specific city is doing. Um, so Janie, I mean, you manage resiliency planning in the largest city in America. And obviously New York City is facing multiple climate change impacts, anywhere from sea level rise to erratic rainfall and heat events are all on the rise. So with all these things occurring, it's obviously there's an urgency, but give us some examples um, of how you and your team are innovating to address the climate crisis that is, that is here now. 
Sure, thanks Sally and thanks to the Simpson Center and um, to Island Press for pulling this conversation together. Um, you know, it's great to be um, in this conversation with you and Carolyn and Paul. Um, we're actually working with Carolyn on some of these innovative insurance approaches in New York City. So, um, you know, excited for that partnership as well. Um, you know, let me just take a step back and, and provide a bit more context about what we're experiencing here in New York City. Um, New York City has a population of 8.6 million and it's growing. Um, we expect to reach 9 million by 2040. And we have 520 miles of coastline. Our 100 coastal communities um, are as diverse as the strategies we need to protect them from rising seas and coastal storms. Um, and by the, by the way, that 520 miles is more than Los Angeles, San Francisco, Miami, and Boston combined. Um, um, so as you can imagine, sea level rise is a um, urgent threat that we are um, acting to protect the city against. Um, but we are, we are a waterfront city and it's really important to us that we remain a, a waterfront city. We're not trying to wall ourselves off from the water, but rather integrate flood protection into all the other uses that we rely on the waterfront for. And, um, and, and as you said, Sally, we are um, facing a, a, a multi, we're facing multiple climate threats, not just sea level rise and coastal storms, but also extreme heat. Um, we expect the number of 90 degree day, days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit to triple by the 2050s. Um, and, and we're experiencing an increase in intense precipitation, which is notable because it affects um, inland communities as well as coastal communities. And by the way, when we talk about sea level rise, um, we're expecting about two feet of, of sea level rise by the 2050s, and, and that number goes up to six feet by the end of the century. Um, so the challenges are immense, um, and we're implementing a multi-layered strategy to uh, build resilience in the city. So that starts at the coastal edge, our 520 miles of coastline, um, we're uh, uh, building a whole new class of infrastructure to protect um, some of our most vulnerable coastal communities from the impacts of storm surge and sea level rise. Um, doing that on different time scales um, and, and uh, you know, prioritizing the most vulnerable. Um, we're also upgrading our buildings. The city has 1 million buildings, um, over 70,000 in the uh, current floodplain. Um, and so uh, we're, we're making sure that we're um, building the, the most uh, resilient building code in the world while also retrofitting at least public buildings for now. Um, we have a $3 billion investment into public housing um, that came after Sandy to, to retrofit those buildings, um, but uh, certainly working to expand um, um, that work as well. Um, we're also uh, hardening our critical infrastructure and services um, to make sure that we're minimizing disruptions to those services uh, during and after an extreme event. And then finally, we're working with residents and small businesses to get them the information they need to make better decisions in the face of a changing climate. Um, so, you know, you asked what we're doing that's innovative. And actually, I, you know, I think resilience is, and urban resilience in particular is still very much an emerging field. So much of what we're doing doesn't have precedent. Um, so I would, I would contend that most of what we're doing is quite innovative, but I'll, I'll um, uh, stop being cheeky and um, actually answer the question and maybe start with our coastal projects because I do think that they get um, some of the, the most attention. Um, you know, as I said, we're building a new class of infrastructure um, and, and working to integrate uh, coastal protection at the coastal edge. So, you know, like I said, we don't want to block off views. We know coastal um, areas are important recreational areas. We have a new ferry system in the city. We want to make sure we still have access to that. Um, one example of a project that we're building that we actually recently started construction on is the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project. Um, and it's a two and a half mile long project that will protect 110,000 residents on the Lower East Side, 28,000 of whom live in public housing. Um, much of the footprint of the project overlaps with East River Park. So we're, we're actually raising the park about eight to 10 feet and building the coastal protection at the water's edge. And the protection will continue north of the park um, and kind of tie in with Hospital Row for those of you who know Manhattan. Um, you know, the project is not just about safety though. It is about improving the recreational amenities that this community uh, has and needs. Um, the, the closest green space that this community has besides East River Park is Central Park, which is actually quite far away. So it's important that, um, you know, the community is able to get the most utility out of East River Park. And um, it's, it's a beloved park, um, but we heard from the community that, you know, it already has these uh, courts and tracks and, um, and, and fields, but they're all fenced off and they need better interstitial spaces for families to gather and have picnics. So we're building that into the new design of the park. 
Um, we're also improving waterfront access, actually. So uh, there are right now um, these pedestrian bridges that go over the FDR Drive, which again, if you know Manhattan, it's, it's essentially a highway. Um, and they're quite rickety. They're hard to navigate if you have a stroller or a wheelchair. So we're replacing those bridges with, um, with, with uh, bridges that will provide universal access, which will create a much more inviting entry into the park. Um, you know, and I, I mentioned these things, they seem small, but they really are meant to improve the quality of life of this community. This is uh, ultimately a $1.45 billion project. Um, and uh, when we were making this investment, we wanted to make sure that we were really um, yielding these co-benefits, um, not, just, not just building flood protection and safety. Um, of course, that was one of the primary purposes, but we felt like the, the investment could go much further. Um, and I, I would be remiss to not men if I didn't mention uh, the the fact that community engagement has been absolutely critical to this project. Um, it, it's it's uh, you know the community's input has really yielded what this project is today um, and has helped us uncover these co benefits. Um, so I will I will leave it at that and hope to talk about some of the other innovative things we're doing um, as the discussion goes on. Well, wow, that's, I mean, that is innovative. You are so right. Um, you know, we're learning as we go and, you know, other cities are so lucky to have such a, a large city like New York to uh, be testing all these things for other um, communities. I mean, I'm from Boston, as you know, and I think Boston with its coastal area can, waterfront can really learn a lot from you uh, in your experience. And so, you know, one of the things we do hear a lot about for coastal cities is seawalls um, and um, you know resilience projects talk about seawalls and talk about hardening shorelines and obviously there are pros and cons to hardening um, shorelines and there's no way one can harden the entire shoreline nor do we want to. Um, I, I noted that last month your office released a whole new waterfront plan and that addresses this issue and it also focuses on um, the issues I was talking about, the land use the up in the watershed as well, as well as nature-based solutions and housing mobility. Um, all sort of positive, controversial, you know, people think different things about this. So I was wondering if you could maybe speak a bit more about how New York City is approaching these issues uh, as highlighted in your new waterfront plan. Sure, happy to. So, you know, every 10 years, the um, the city is required to develop a comprehensive waterfront plan. And we recently released um, the uh, this year's comprehensive waterfront plan um, for public comment. So the final will actually come out sometime in the fall. Um, but we introduced some new concepts um, in this year's comprehensive waterfront plan, um, including, like you said, Sally, this concept of housing mobility. So, you know, while Coastal protection is something we certainly will continue to pursue. Um, we also know that coastal protection has its limits. We're not going to be able to um, you know, engineer our way out of the challenges that climate change presents. And we certainly will not be able to harden all 520 miles of New York City's coastline. Um, we hear a lot in the discussions about climate adaptation, this concept of managed retreat. Um, but stepping back from that, you know, we know that we live in a segregated city. Um, the systems that make New York City segregated still exist today, whether it's our financial and banking services, whether it's the real estate market, whether it's land use planning. So if we are going to commit to ensuring that the investments we're making resilience and adaptation um, also address the inequities we see in our communities today, which, which we have committed to, we are, we are hoping and, and certainly aim to make um, our adaptation investments not only improve quality of life, but also improve equity in the city. Um, we really need to sort of shift the conversation away from a focus on property value and land value, which is I think what managed retreat ultimately focuses on, and rather than, rather than that, focus on people, really make this a people-centric conversation. Um, as I mentioned, we have a growing population in New York City. Um, one, one result of that, one consequence of that is that we also have, a, a, we are a city in an affordable housing crisis. Um, and um, when we think about how to manage the risks of climate change, um, uh, we have to also acknowledge that um, we uh, are already facing a housing shortage um, and need to figure out and, and have very few spaces in the city, have very few open land to build new housing, have very little open land to build new housing. So um, we're really introducing this concept of um, housing stability as being a fundamental right of New Yorkers 
and housing mobility as a concept that we need to start thinking about and defining further as, um, as really an important principle to achieve housing stability in the face of climate change. Um, I think we're really still defining exactly what, what housing mobility means, but want to start a conversation with New Yorkers about what it looks like. Um, you know, we um, also have introduced a new, um, a relatively new land use framework um, in the comprehensive waterfront plan. Um, essentially, it, it provides a spectrum of, um, of, of, of uh, sort of where we'll build and um, and sort of density decisions, right? There are going to be places where we continue to upzone and build more density. Those places will likely be outside of the floodplain. Um, there are places where we'll want to um, maintain current density, and then there will be places where we limit density. And um, we've created a new zoning designation called Special Coastal Risk Districts, um, where we are limiting density. These are places that are already experiencing regular tidal flooding. Places. Um, like Carolyn described, um, they're, they're seeing the chronic impacts of tidal flooding and are quite vulnerable. And so through a great deal of community engagement, we've decided that we're going to limit density in these places with this new zoning designation. Um, and so there's certainly, um, uh, you know, I think some uh, alignment between this land use framework and the idea of housing mobility. Um, but like I said, we're, we're just starting a conversation with New Yorkers and need to define this further. Oh, that's terrific. Um, boy, uh, this idea of managed for cheat and uh, mobility, housing mobility is housing stability. I mean, that's, uh, that's a whole new concept and uh, good for you all for taking it on. Um, with that, I'd like to turn to Paul and ask Paul a couple of questions. Um, you know, at the national level, um, Paul, FEMA plays such a critical role in helping uh, coastal cities um, in the U.S. prepare for disasters, and as we all know the phrase now, to build back better. Um, so what are some of the administration's goals and priorities overall, and how does the federal government aid coastal cities collectively to build resilience? Yeah, thanks, Sally. Um, thanks, the Simpson Center and Island Press for hosting this great event. and. Uh, it's a real honor to have such great panelists uh, to share the stage with. Um, as you know, the Biden administration's identified seven immediate priorities, COVID-19, economy, equity, climate change, healthcare, immigration, and restoring America's global standing. Of course, FEMA has been in the mix of a lot of those things, including just uh, helping with the COVID-19 response. And recently, um, uh, we just closed this week uh, the COVID-19 vaccination federal presence, uh, which was really successful in, in helping vaccinate the nation. So FEMA has, our strength is interagency coordination and bringing the, the federal resources to bear on, on national problems. Um, and it's been a busy time, um, but we're excited about the administration's priorities. You know, I've been at FEMA 15 years and I recall back to the, it seems like every year the disasters and the extreme weather continues to grow. I recall back to working in the National Response Coordination Center in 2017, working 24 seven and uh, seven days a week. I, I was uh, on a 14 hour shift that day. Harvey had been, uh, you know, really damaging and impactful. And we saw Maria and Irma coming on shore. And that day, as I was listening to the ops brief out, you know, there was a wildfire and then also a major earthquake in South America. And we always have this little report out on solar flares and there's usually nothing reported on solar flares, but that day there was extreme activity in solar flares. So I got home and I thought, what else could happen? And I saw ants on my counter and I thought, this is it. This is how, how bad can it get? Um, and it seems like every year it seems a little bit worse. Last year, we saw 30 named storms on top of COVID. We got into the Greek alphabet for, for named storms. You know, it was the sixth consecutive year in which 10 or more billion dollar weather and climate events had impacted the United States. Like you said in your opening remarks, Sally, the coastal communities, I mean, so important to the social, cultural, and economic backbone in this country. You know, 40% of the American population lives in the coastal counties, and that population is growing. We've seen an increase of about 10 million people uh, over the last decade move into the coast. But coasts are also where the most expensive disasters take place. You know, 10 of, 
uh, the 10 most expensive disasters in US history, seven have incurred in the coastal areas. So that's where we play at FEMA and the federal family in, in terms of uh, our mission to help people before, during, and after disasters. You'll see in the administration's priorities, the climate crisis is, is front and center. But along with it, you'll also hear a lot of, uh, of uh, talk about equity because the two are, and I'm glad Carolyn and Janie talk, talked about it, the two are intersected. But we see a disproportionate impact uh, post-disaster on the most vulnerable communities in our country. So we're excited that we're starting to do things, but there's a lot more to do. The first thing we're gonna do is look, look at all of our programs with the lens of equity, right? How do we deliver? What are the barriers and entries? How do we look at our programs and kind of turn them over and say, are we delivering them in a fair way? Um, one of the programs in the, in the helping people before disasters uh, is the BRIC program, the Building Resilience Infrastructure Communities Program that we're really excited about. In fact, the president just announced a couple of weeks ago that the next cycle, the BRIC program is going to have a billion dollars. He's doubled our budget there. And that allows us to do pre-disaster mitigation to build things stronger and safer for the future. And like Carolyn said, we have to be agile about that. We have to not just pick a point in time, but we have to think about being constantly evaluating. Um, we're excited that the BRIC program for the first time, it's a grant program, we're giving points for those applicants that consider future conditions. We're also giving points for socially vulnerable communities and low impoverished communities. So we're trying to bring more people to the table and we're trying to think about the future, right? Not just the present. We're also thinking about co-benefits and I think we need to have more discussion about this across the agency and the federal family. When I think about co-benefits, we've always done things like buyouts or nature-based solutions. But if you think about buyouts, it's, you know, these three homes, they have a benefit because instead of being flooded over and over in the future to save federal dollars, there's a benefit to say, let's buy them out because the losses will be less in the future. Well, I think co-benefits also is that's creating green space. That green space is helping for the climate crisis and reduction of carbon. So we should think about those type of things, incentivizing more of those co-benefit type solutions. Post disasters where our agency has a lot of dollars. We come in, but we can't do it all, but our job is to help um, when there's a large disaster and, and help rebuild the communities. Uh, take Puerto Rico, for example, you know, we're helping rebuild much of the power grid there. And when we talk about sustainability, we wanna build things back so that in our previous way of thinking about sustainability, that they are resistant to future disasters. I think we actually could expand that definition of sustainability and think about, hey, what if we build back and down the co-benefits line and think about sustainable energy, right? So here are ways that we're starting to get creative and innovative and in saying, where can we push the needle a little bit, not just to do what FEMA has done in the past, but also have a co-benefit to reducing the climate crisis. And it's an exciting time to do that. The last thing I'd say is uh, there is an executive order. It's called the Federal Flood Risk Management Standard. Um, it's been signed into uh, signed by the president. And all federal investments in floodplains are going to have to elevate vertically in a different way. So that work is starting again. It's going to require a lot of dialogue with stakeholders in the private sector um, and, and states and locals and territories. But uh, I'm excited about the opportunity to start building back with federal dollars stronger. Oh, thanks. A lot of fantastic examples of where FEMA is going, um, what are your priorities, et cetera. So I guess I have a question. I don't know if you can answer this, but if you were to pinpoint, you know, one of, um, you know, the issues that FEMA is most concerned about as a priority could you highlight that or, or, or is there, I mean, you just talked about so many new and innovative areas you're heading in, but what is it that you specifically think, you know, what keeps you up at night and that you think you really have to tackle in the short term? Yeah, I mean, I think we are really stepping back. I mean, I've been at the agency for over 15 years and it's the first time we've stepped back and said, hey, let's look at things through a lens of equity. Uh, an example of that is the COVID-19 vaccination mission. So when we set up federal uh, vaccination centers across the nation, we use data and we use discussions with um, locals and communities, but what data we use was also social vulnerability data. 
where do we place these facilities so there's more accessibility, public transportation, they're targeted in a, in a community, um, minority communities, low impoverished communities, so that's, there's more accessibility. The one I went to recently in Atlanta, we opened uh, extra hours. Later at night, early in the morning that night I was there, we were open till 10. And part of that is to make sure that there was, there's fairness and equity and accessibility so that folks working hourly shifts could take, didn't have to take off time, they could come in after work and get their shot. So put on that lens and let's apply that to things like the climate crisis, the delivery of programs like BRIC, like recovery grants, like pre-disaster grants, like insurance. And let's think about barriers of entry. Let's think about ways that we can deliver our programs so that we're helping those that most need help. Um, and I think that's a huge priority. And I think uh, that's gonna underline everything we do. Great, thank you. Um, that's actually gonna drive me to, I'm gonna ask all of you one more question for everybody uh, that I think you've all touched on that's really important. Um, obviously it's clear that poor communities are disproportionately impacted by climate change and this building back better is, you know, historically it's more likely to occur first in wealthier, more politically connected communities. I mean, we've seen this in the past in New Orleans and even in New York after Sandy and Houston. So um, with climate change exacerbating and kind of reinforcing these existing inequalities, can you all talk about some examples or projects where you're really focusing on meeting both the resilience aspect as well as the equity goals that are so important? And um, just raise your hand and that's for all three of you. Uh, I'm happy to jump in, Sally. Um, you know, I, I um, the portfolio that I described earlier, the resilience portfolio that um, that, that we're implementing in, in New York City is, um, is it's essentially a $20 billion portfolio, over $20 billion actually, but 15 billion of that comes from um, the federal government uh, through post uh, Sandy recovery funds. So we're very much at a juncture in our work in New York City because most of those projects are now moving into implementation and, and construction. And um, we're really gonna have to think more creatively about how we finance this work going forward. Um, but that also means that, you know, we'll be able to play a, a more directive role in where, um, which projects we're prioritizing and where the money goes. A lot of the, the work after Sandy um, was done very closely in partnership with the federal government. And sometimes it was federal agencies really sort of choosing projects and where they went rather than um, uh, the city prior, you know, being in the role of prioritizing. Um, so we're actually creating kind of a new coastal vulnerability index. Um, and it's modeled af after our, um, our heat vulnerability index. Um, so let me just describe that for a second. It, it's a index that takes both the physical indicators of heat risk into account, things like density and lack of vegetation, as well as the social indicators of heat risk, things like race and poverty. You know, we know that extreme heat disproportionately impacts low income communities of color. And it also impacts some of our most vulnerable residents, the elderly, uh, chronically disabled. So we wanted to take all of that into account as we figured out where to prioritize our city investments into heat resiliency. Um, when you map all of those factors, it's quite clear that uh, the South Bronx, Northern Manhattan and Central Brooklyn are the areas of the city that are most vulnerable to extreme heat, both from a physical perspective as well as a social. Um, so that's where we're prioritizing our investments. We're investing in planting street trees to increase vegetation. Um, we are targeting our uh, cool roofs coatings. Um, these are, it's just a simple solution of coating rooftops with a special reflective white coating so that we're increasing reflective surfaces. They have the impact of lowering building temperatures, but when you cluster them in, in geographic proximity, they actually um, bring down ambient temperatures and make neighborhoods cooler. Um, and it's a workforce development program. So it's, um, it's a great program. And we're clustering those rooftop coatings in, in those areas that I mentioned. And we're also making programmatic investments to 
pair them with these um, uh, physical investments. So um, things like training home health aides. So when they're making their rounds, they know how to detect early signs of heat illness and can help their patients stay hydrated, or they know to encourage their patients to turn on their AC if they have one to 78 degrees Fahrenheit, because it's a way to stay safe without driving up your energy bill, right? So, so we're, we're targeting all of those investments in these areas that I mentioned um, based on our analysis of both the physical and social indicators of heat risk. We're now similarly creating a coastal vulnerability index. So going forward, we will be able to make similar decisions, not just based on the physical vulnerability of coastal communities, but also the social vulnerability of coastal communities. Um, it's complicated. There will be different factors that we, we account for, um, but we're excited to be creating this tool. Um, and I think it will really drive more transparent decision-making as well as more equitable decision-making. Thanks, Janie. Um, Okay, go ahead, Paul. And then I'd like to be mindful of our time. So we have so many great questions that have come in. So if you could hit on it briefly, then I'm gonna ask a few of the questions that we've heard from folks already, if that's okay. Yeah, just two quick things. Uh, I mentioned the BRIC program earlier. One of the innovative things the BRIC program is doing is uh, providing some free technical assistance. So we're trying a pilot in which, you know, if a community, you know, the grant process we're realizing is complex, and sometimes very burdensome for those communities that can't afford to apply for grants. And this includes coastal communities. Um, so we're providing free technical assistance. It's as easy as the community writes uh, the state and the, and the region and says, I'm interested in getting your assistance. And we're gonna help them look at their risks, help plan out projects and help put together a good grants package. So that's the type of thing where, you know, instead of, a, I'm fortunate I live in a, in Northern Virginia in a wealthy community that can hire grant special, specialized grant uh, consultants that can pull, pull all that stuff together. Well, not every community has that. So we're testing that. Additionally, Carolyn mentioned um, our national flight insurance program. We're rolling out this fall risk rating 2.0, which is actually for the first time creating, uh, solving an inequity we saw in that we didn't, that we didn't rate the premiums based on the cost of the home, the replacement cost of the home which meant lower value homes were, were paying more than they should have um, over uh, higher value homes. So by fixing that inequity, it's helping us think about, hey, our cost benefit analysis for other programs, shouldn't we think about normalizing uh, things that generally have a higher benefit if they're a higher, more expensive cost, which is creating an inequ inequity. Can we think about what we're doing with, with, with risk rating and think about what we're doing in the cost benefit analysis we do in recovery and, and uh, mitigation. So I'm gonna get back to that in a second, but before we do, I, I, one of the questions we've received is a little bit more kind of um, about flood hazard mitigation um, and um, some of the engineering issues um, about flood barriers. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of the cities are talking about building these flood barriers. Um, how, how do you expect that's going to work? Um, and is it ecologically versus what it will do for the safety of, of, of residents? Um, I don't know if any of you have thoughts on that. Um, so I can I can speak to the barriers that are being studied in New York City. So, um, you know, you may know that the Army Corps is um, actually conducting a regional New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary study. Um, it was, I should say, they were conducting a study. It was paused during the Trump administration, um, and we are hopeful that it will restart soon. Um, but they are looking at some uh, potential major infrastructure pot projects, um, including some in-water barriers, one of which um, would stretch from Breezy Point near, uh, in New York at the tip of the Rockaways all the way to Sandy Hook, New Jersey. Um, so, you know, I think our position in New York City has been that we should study these barriers. We should understand the ecological impacts of these barriers. We should also understand what the operations and maintenance would take. Um, they would present all kinds of new governance challenges and probably would require their own governance entities to operate um, and maintain. 
Um, but we know that you know the path to building these barriers, if if they you know turn out to be good ideas, um, would be a, a very long one. Um, you know, the Army Corps is currently only authorized to study uh, such barriers. Um, we would need uh, new congressional action to actually authorize them to construct and and a, an appropriations process, um, which feels. Um, you know, like it would be, uh, it could be out of reach. Like I, I, one of these barriers could cost tens of billions of dollars until it take 20 to 30 years to construct. Um, and so while we are studying them, um, because we wanna make sure we're exploring all options, we are not waiting for that study um, and are continuing right now to uh, pursue options that the city is able to, to um, design and construct um, on our own, and, and sometimes with partners as well. But um, but most of those options are on land, um, with with a few exceptions. Um, I, I think the point here is that you know we we want to we don't want to rule anything out prematurely, but we we certainly know that um, some of these major infrastructure projects come with um, with quite serious concerns as well. Okay. Um... I'm glad to hear you're not waiting, <laughs> but the studies go forward, but you're not waiting. You've got all so many of the innovative ideas that you've talked about already. And that kind of takes me to a question that Paul sort of hit on a minute ago um, that's in the chat, which is, you know, these are expensive projects. Um, uh, and cities like New York certainly um, have more funds than some of the smaller and medium sized cities. And, and as we're trying to, you know, uh, our Corby projects where we're doing um, decision support tools for resiliency planning is really focusing on some of the um, um, uh, SID, small and developing states and some of the lower income uh, cities and countries around the world. But we also in the United States have mid and small size cities that are also having to address um, financial concerns. So what can really be done to help these small and medium sized cities get more prepared uh, for what's coming. And so I guess, let me ask Paul that. Um, and then when I say what's coming, I guess what's already here and what do they need to do to, you know, what's the federal government able to do to help prepare them uh, for what has arrived? Yeah, you know, here's where we don't have all the answers. I think we need a whole of community um, kind of uh, challenge out there to say, can we get private sector industries to think about their investments and their continuity of business in, in small communities? Can we think about getting nonprofits that can step up and help these smaller communities uh, find resources? But within the federal family, you know, one of the things that we're reevaluating, we need it, and we're going to try to do an analysis on this here is our cost benefit um, to bring dollars to match. Um, can we use other things like? Uh, reduction in carbon? Can we use other things like, I know the National Hazard, Hazard, Hazard Center, and I think Carolyn's very familiar with it, has talked about cumulative harm. So the benefit isn't just monetary, uh, it is the, the social impacts of, of the disaster. And if you bring those forward, there is a benefit that is very great there, and the offsetting cost perhaps could be lowered. So um, it's creating interest in the communities, it is working with partners that can help step in and fill voids and help communities that have lesser means. Um, and it's really trying to rethink the way we kind of evaluate the benefit and what we can count as some of the costs that we put into it. I'll add one thought here as well. You know, one of the things that um, we were recently able to accomplish in New York City is a, a mandate um, to account for all future climate risks um, that includes storm surge, sea level rise, intense precipitation, and extreme heat in the design and construction of all of our capital projects. So all new and substantially rehab buildings and infrastructure projects. And this is significant because it just means that we're making sure that the dollars we spend on buildings and infrastructure go farther um, and, and are built to last, right? They're, they're um, uh, being invested in climate resilient projects, um, whether it's a school or a library or a road or a wastewater treatment plant. Um, and, and we're not just thinking about climate resilient projects as um, flood walls and levees, right? Which I, I think often, um, uh, often the attention sort of goes there as I started off with in, in my remarks. So um, I think that's another important thing that cities can do. Um, it's not just about 
um, bringing big new sums of money to build flood walls and levees and other climate resilient infrastructure. It's making sure that the infrastructure we're already building uh, is is uh, built to um, built in a way that considers future risk. Now, the thing that's, that small and medium sized cities need that they often don't have is downscale data. Um, we in New York City have um, uh, the great fortune of working with a um, merrily appointed panel of uh, independent panel of scientists, uh, the New York City Panel on Climate Change, which again, by local law are required to provide us downscale projections every three years. And so um, we have that resource here. I think this is another area where the federal government can be really helpful to um, provide uh, smaller and medium sized cities that downscale data so that they are able to incorporate it into the, the, the projects that are already being built. Okay, I'm going to throw one more question out um, that we have, and then while I'm doing that, think about before we close, if you had one sentence or thing you wanted to say to people to watch this space, um, great if you could all sort of think about that um, as far as, you know, what's coming uh, in the near term. But before I do that, I, I want to just ask about, we have a good question about managed retreat um, and how it deals with the resilience of people, but yet it's so painful socially. And as, uh, as we've seen in so many cases resisted, although in some cases we're seeing it being embraced. Um, and it seems like wealthier people are more able to move. Um, so I guess there's a lot of contradictions when it comes to managed retreat, um, um, you know, whether it's being able to purchase uh, new places to live or move. Um, and it kind of sometimes can be contradictory to some of the FEMA responses, as well as contradictory to the public private responses. So that's a lot of issues that uh, have been rolled into one question, but um, I don't know if anyone would care to comment on that. I'll start with something, <clears throat> and I think the question's exactly right. It's a very fraught issue, and there's a lot of pieces. Um, and I think also when retreat makes sense and in what form is highly localized, right, and has to be sort of a community level decision. But there are um, some bigger picture issues that I think can be influenced by sort of state and federal frameworks as well. Um, so you mentioned some of these in the question. You know, one is the cost of relocation, and often sometimes folks are living in risky areas because they can't afford to live elsewhere. Um, and so we have, you know, some buyout programs to try to help pay for those, you know, pay for the property. But some, if, if where you have to go is much more expensive, that you end up worse off and that doesn't help you, right? Um, and I think we also have some challenges with a lot of relocation happening in a sort of um, terribly, uh, uh, upsetting post-disaster context, right, where it's uh, sort of a response to a severe event. Um, and there's been, you know, the sort of federal help to help with those is usually really, really slow to get to people um, and leaves them struggling for quite some time. And so there's been some thinking about innovations and how we can help get people the dollars to relocate much faster so they're not left struggling for so long. Um, but the bigger questions of, you know, community um, relationships and identity are really hard and there's, and they're global, right? I mean, it's not just like the U.S. coastal communities, we're seeing this acute, you know, island nations are facing this in a very existential way. Um, and I think we don't have super good answers, but I think if we sort of keep putting forward the frame of how can we enable people to make decisions that help them, that's important. And, and I'll just add one last little thought on it too, is also getting people you know, sort of comfortable with the idea that there has to, there's going to have to be change. We can't stop the sea rising now, right? It's going to happen. It's inevitable. And so there are places that we're going to have to come to the idea with that we're kind of moving. Um, anyway. Okay. Um, Paul, do you want to hit on that briefly? And then I'm going to ask each of you to give me a 30 second sort of what you think everyone should keep an eye out for. I think Carolyn said it well. I mean, we've always had you know, buyout programs and a retreat um, is something we've talked about. But at the end of the day, the challenge is individuals have to have a place to go. go. There's a sense of community and culture. And this is my home. Um, but we're also seeing it as disasters become more severe, there's more interest. So I think there will be a tipping point. And I think to Carolyn's point, we have to make it efficient and effective 
So when that demand signal sounds that in, from a federal perspective, we can be there to help make sure that uh, it's easy. Because if you miss the opportunity, what we know is people just rebuild um, quickly back to where they were. So I think that's something that we're looking at in terms of ease and speed. Um, but at the end of the day, it is really complex because it comes down to people and their sense of community and home, um, plus the resources it takes to actually then relocate. We learned something over the last year in that um, for certain portions of the population, and unfortunately, um, uh, the lower income communities uh, don't have this, but working anywhere is possible. So you may see a demographic change anyway across the nation. Uh, based on what we learned over the last year and perhaps that will start making shifts in terms of what we see in terms of communities in our community in, in our in our nation great thanks um gosh i can't believe an hour has already buzzed by so let me ask each of you 30 seconds you know a sentence that's what you think we should keep our eye on um uh, as a community and let's start with janie if we could Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think it's exciting that the Biden administration has prioritized climate action and resilience. Um, I think the American Jobs Plan actually presents a once in a generation opportunity um, to invest in resilient infrastructure. Um, I, but I think the devil's going to be in the details. So I would, I would keep an eye on that. Great. Carolyn? Um, I I think what I'd highlight is something that Paul and Janie have been talking about, and I keep an eye on what they and their colleagues are doing, because I think this concept of climate equity and climate justice is finally starting to be operationalized um, in terms of what that really means and how to have change with it through the, through the work they're doing. <laughs> Perfect. And Paul, your thoughts? Yeah, the term co-benefits comes to mind, and not just on what we talked about with climate, but also with equity. So let's be smarter about the limited resources we do have, so investments have dual benefit, both reducing uh, impacts of climate change, but also helping build more equity into the nation and also lowering the carbon emissions. Great. Co-benefits, social equity, and the Biden infrastructure plan, all really good points to end on. So um, I want to first apologize. We got so many excellent questions and just don't have enough time um, to uh, reach them all. But I do want to thank um, all of our panelists for doing such an excellent job. Um, and remind everyone that this has been recorded. It will be up on the Stimson uh, uh, website later. So if you uh, wanna check in on anything you've heard, please do that. And then just a reminder again, Carolyn's book, uh, you can get that at a discount on Island Press's website by typing in the code webinar, all in caps. So with that, big thank you to everyone and uh, I hope everyone has a fantastic day.